This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you Episode 50 of Season 2 of the Westford Wardsman Podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, December 11th, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford in 1909. This issue starts with the Westford Center section. The members of the Union Congregational Church are busily preparing for their annual banquet Tuesday evening, December 14th at 7 o'clock. The committee in charge of the banquet are working hard to have it as enjoyable as in former former seasons, and the post-prandial exercises are expected to prove bright and entertaining. Genial John Wright comes up from Lowell to serve as Toastmaster. Other speakers from Lowell are Reverend A.C. Farron of the High Street Church and the president of the Lowell Board of Trade. There will be good music and some excellent home talent represented among the speakers. Sunday at the Congregational Church, Reverend Charles P. Marshall exchanged pulpits with with Reverend A. R. Atwood of Quincy, who gave his his hearers an excellent discourse, a ringing charge to his hearers to serve the church of their allegiance according to their several abilities. Mr. Atwood was a capable and engaging speaker and is just leaving his Quincy pastorate for a much larger one in Patterson, New Jersey. Arthur E. Day sang as a solo, One Sweetly Solemn Thought. At the evening service, Reverend Howard M. Langdale of Tewksbury had charge of the meeting, which was interesting and well attended. The Edward M. Abbott Hose Company held their regular monthly meeting at their headquarters on Boston Road Tuesday evening with full attendance. A supper was served in charge of O.R. Spaulding, Sebastian B. Watson, and John Feeney, Jr. The members did full justice to the appetizing viands. The new red shirts were worn for the first time. It was voted to give a dance the latter part of January. Committee of arrangements were John Feeney Jr., Robert Prescott, and Fred Clement. Mrs. John C. Abbott began on Monday to furnish hot soup or cocoa for the children who are transported daily to the William E. Frost School. The same as last year, either soup or cocoa is served to the children with their lunches during the noon recess. This gracious and generous manifestation of interest in the children by Mrs. Abbott is much appreciated. Mr. Mr. and Mrs. George W. Goode left town this week for their customary winter sojourn sojourn to New York. Fred A. Smith has sold his large milk route to Ralph Bridgeford, who takes possession this week. Mr. Smith goes as soon as he can make arrangements to leave to South Lake Weir, that's in Florida, the same town where Mr. and Mrs. A. H. Foss and Mr. and Mrs. Pearl Harmon are spending the winter, making quite a group of Westford people in that place. Mrs. Alma Richardson entertained very pleasantly a group of friends at her home Saturday evening. Mrs. Richardson well understands the happy art of combining the genial hostess and capable housewife, which so ensures the enjoyment of guests. A turkey dinner was served at 7 o'clock, at which covers were laid for 10. Among the guests were Frank E. Wilkins of Milford, New Hampshire, who has recently returned from an extensive Western trip, which included the, the Seattle Exposition, California, Yellowstone Park, Colorado, etc. He had brought back some particularly fine views of various places visited, and during the evening entertained the guests with these pictures and descriptions of some of the beauty spots of our own country. Some timely literature has been received from the Society for the Protection of Native Plants with its appeal at the approaching Christmas season against thoughtless and extravagant gathering of evergreens, especially the laurel, which is a slow-growing plant, and the immoderate gathering of which, in some places, threatens its extinction. The next section is the Grange section. Several western Westford patrons attended the meeting of the Middlesex North Pomona Grange at Oddfellows Hall in Lowell on December 13th, uh, December 3rd. This session meant more than usual in one way to Westford patrons, as they, under the direction of Mrs. Josie Prescott, had the dinner in their care. 
The morning session was occupied by the annual election of officers. Paul O. Dutton of Chelmsford was elected master, S.J. Anthony of Carlisle, overseer, Mrs. Sherburn of Tingsboro, lecturer, and most of the others were re-elected. In the afternoon session, state lecturer Gardner gave a short talk in his usual helpful vein. Reverend N.S. Hoagland of Tingsboro gave an address on, quote, the greatest wealth, end quote, emphasizing health as invaluable, as with that one had the most essential part of an equipment for the battle of life. The program was finished out with music and readings. The election of officers to serve the organization for next year was the program for last Thursday evening at the Grange. The attendance was good and much interest shown in choosing these officers. Frank C. Wright was elected master. He brings to the chair the experience of former service in this capacity and a genuine interest in the Grange's welfare. Miss Martha Grant accepted the office of lecturer on which so much of the su success of the meetings depend. Mrs. Frank Wright, who has been the faithful secretary for a number of years, was re-elected. The remaining officers were as follows. Willie M. Wright, uh, uh, O, I believe that's for overseer, Louis Jenkins, steward, John Feeney, Jr., assistant steward, Fred C. Clement, gatekeeper, Mrs. L. W. Wheeler, chap chaplain, Mrs. David L. Grieg, Assistant Steward, Leonard W. Wheeler, Treasurer, Miss Elizabeth Cushing, Flora, Mrs. John H. Colburn, Pomona, Miss Grace Bennett, Series, Executive Committee for three years, Alonzo H. Sutherlands, and C. A. Blaining, M.D. The members voted to send the retiring master, Alonzo H. Sutherland, and Mrs. Sutherland to the coming sessions of the State Grange at Springfield. Also, to send Miss Grant, lecturer elect, to the lecturers' conference held the second day of the state Grange meeting. As indicated here, the lecturer was an important position. Uh, the le lecturer was kind of the program committee chair and was responsible for obtaining some sort of entertainment for each of the Grange meetings, and there were two a month, so that was a pretty responsible job. The next section is the Tadmuck Club. Members of the Tadmont Club are much indebted to Miss Edith M. Foster for the delightful program arranged by her for the club's regular meeting Tuesday afternoon, which took place in the vestry of the Congregational Church. This change of meeting place was for the availability of piano. The subject for the afternoon was, quote, the conservation of our natural resources, end quote, a sub subject by no means dry and technical as the speakers presented it and was followed with thoughtful interest by a good-sized audience. In clear and logical fashion, Miss Foster depicted the great wealth of our natural resources as found by the early settlers in soil, forests, rivers, mines, animals, fisheries, etc., and gave many facts concerning our thoughtless depletion which, without strenuous measures of prevention, will prove a serious menace to the country's future prosperity. This paper showed careful research and was ably written and well delivered. Miss Foster balanced her program with some musical numbers that were much enjoyed. The soloists were Mrs. Oliver Wellington Priest of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and Miss Miriam Stanley Carlton of Lynn. Miss Marion Sweet or Sweat, whose skillful playing is well known to Westford audiences, was the capable accompanist. The solos were rendered with much feeling and expression, and the encores by Miss Priest and Miss Carlton were graceful little gems of melody. At the next meeting, December 21st, Mrs. Grace Lawrence of Littleton Women's Club will be the speaker of the of the afternoon with, quote, Mary England, end quote, for a subject. Mrs. Lawrence is by no means a stranger to many of our members who will be glad to greet her and listen to her presentation of what sounds like so charming a subject. Uh, there are two Grace Lawrences that appear in the Westford Wardsmen of this time period. The one mentioned here is Mrs. Grace Lawrence, who lived in Littleton, and the other one is Miss Grace Lawrence, who lived in Forge Village. A club tea will be served, and the meeting will be held in the parlors of the Unitarian Church. Next is the About Town section. 
The high school annual shake of the foot was held in the town hall last week Friday evening. Music was trippingly administered by the popular Grange Orchestra. The affair was a wholesome tonic to social life and an, and gather, and an ingathering of financial strength, although $14 net may not seem like a very striking or strengthening affair. The Unitarian Parish was well represented at the missionary meeting at Lowell last week, Wednesday afternoon and evening, with a special reference to the always calm, tolerant, liberal, and dignified ex-governor John D. Long, a familiar favorite with all Westford. Back in the 1860s, I believe, uh, Governor Long was the preceptor at Westford Academy, and he had a um, lifelong relationship with Westford and its people. The recent death of Colonel Thomas L. Motley at Groton brought up freshly memories of bygone days when prominent citizens of Westford were associated with him in the old representative district of which Westford and Groton formed a part. With pleasure, they recall his genial personality and wreath his memory in unfading flowers. A Christmas collection will be taken up next Sunday at the Unitarian Church with a special reference to providing fruit and flowers for the sick and aged of the parish, as well as the usual jingle jingle for the youthful element of the Sunday school. A Forest Hill Farm in Dunstable, so delightfully visible from the Westford Center and owned by Henry Tolles, also so familiar to Westford, was one of the $25 prize winners for best apples at the recent fruit exhibit in Boston. The man, the hill, and the apples are noted for their substantial qualities. The Grange will hold its next regular meeting next Thursday evening, December 16th. The evening will be observed as planned by the lecture as surprise night. Extensive repairs are being made on the buildings on the farm recently purchased by Pearlie A. Wright on Tadmuck Road. Leonard W. Wheeler was a punctual representative of the farmers of Westford Center at the meetings of the State Board of Agriculture at Drake Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Henry B. Reed manned the situation for the Stony Brook farmers. Alvin G. Poli still continues crippled with old age infirmities and other complications not so elderly. Our popular and alert townsman, the Honorable Herbert E. Fletcher, has given $500 towards the proposed new YMCA building in Lowell. Among those appointed to solicit subscriptions who are residents or natives of Westford was Donald Cameron, Clarence E. Whitten, C. Frank Dupee, and Judge F. A. Frederick A. Fisher. Boston parties have been in town recently offering $2.35 per barrel for apples. The same parties offer $2.50 for the same apples at picking time. It is affirmed that the mild weather has had much to do with lowering prices of apples. Forge Village is the next section. The Ladies' Sewing Circle met with Mrs. Harriet E. Randall Thursday afternoon of this week. Sewing, refreshments, and music helped to pass a very pleasant afternoon. The many friends of Mrs. W. H. Fernald will be pleased to learn that she is improving after her recent operation at Dr. Kilbourne's Hospital in Groton. Mrs. Fernald is a valued member of the Ladies' Sewing Circle. Her speedy recovery is sincerely hoped for. Mrs. William Morton and little daughter, Hazel, of Bridgeport, Connecticut, are spending a few weeks with her mother, Mrs. Mary Murray. Reverend Thomas L. Fisher will exchange pulpits Sunday, December 12th with Reverend David Sprague of the Church of the Good Shepherd in Clinton. Adino Northrup, who has been suffering from a poisoned finger, the result of a sliver, is somewhat better and out of danger. The wool sorters have taken possession of the new two-story brick, brick mill built by Abbott and Company. The tenement, I'm sorry, the cement, the cement foundation is completed for the new three-story brick spinning mill, which is being erected by the same firm. I believe that's the building that's now, or was, or still is located on Pleasant Street in Forge Village. Miss Elizabeth Plummer and Miss Grace Lawrence left here Thursday for Los Angeles, Pasadena, California, where they will spend the winter. The Ladies' Sewing Circle of St. Andrew's Mission will hold an oyster supper in Recreation Hall Saturday evening, December 11th. 
The next uh, couple paragraphs are entitled Accident. Henry Story met with a painful accident Sunday while cleaning out his well. Joseph McDonald was assisting in the work. Mr. Story was at the bottom of the well, which is 22 feet deep, when the iron nozzle of the pump became loose and fell, striking him on the head, causing a deep scalp wound. Only the fact that Mr. Story wore a heavy cap saved him from receiving a fractured skull. Dr. O. V. Wells was hastily summoned and closed the cut with several stitches. Mr. Story recently purchased the old Comey head homestead and is doing extensive repairing. Next is the Graniteville section. John B. Carmichael is now suffering with a sore hand, which keeps him from following his usual employment. Dr. W. H. Sherman is in attendance. On Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock, Mass was celebrated in St. Catherine's Church for the repose of the soul of the late Daniel W. Harrington. The children of the Methodist Episcopal Church Sunday School will commence rehearsals for the Christmas tree exercises in a few days, and the committee in charge are planning on a very elaborate program this year. On Wednesday, being the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, Mass was celebrated in the morning at 7.30 o'clock. In the evening, services were also held at the above-named church. Both services were well attended. On Sunday, December 12th, and until further notice, Mass will be celebrated at 9.45 o'clock instead of 8.45, which has been the custom during the summer months. The children of St. Catherine's Sunday School have already begun rehearsals for the Christmas tree exercises that will be held on Christmas Eve in the church as formerly. The members of St. Catherine's Temperance Society held a social dance in Healy's Hall on last Saturday evening that was well attended. An oyster supper was served in the lower hall. Many were present from out of town. The dance was in charge of the following committee. William Ledwith, general manager, James B. Healy, floor director, Alfred Hughes, Thomas Healy, Omer LeDuc, and Henry Charlton, aides. The next section is titled Electric Lighting. There is some talk here of an electric power company of Lowell making arrangements for installing electric lights in the different houses in the village. This will certainly be a very good thing and a great convenience, but what is an absolute necessity is street lights and plenty of them. It was generally understood that when the new electric road was put through here that the lights would soon follow, but so far they have failed to materialize, and there is not a single public street light along the whole course of the electric road in this village, that is Graniteville, which means a distance of over half a mile. Three crossings are along the route with an open space at the mill pond, and either man or beast is going to get into trouble at these points sooner or later. Next one, next is uh, the firemen's meeting uh, section, and this is actually the last section. The members of the Albert R. Schott Hose Company held their regular meeting on last Monday night with Captain John A. Healy presiding. Much business of importance was transacted. To fill the office made vacant by the death and resignation, the following members were elected. Edward Defoe, Secretary, uh, Secretary Second Lieutenant Henry J. Healy, Treasurer. The application of Carl Hansen for call man was favorably acted upon. William Tussignan was promoted from call man to regular fireman. Two, uh, uh, two applications for call men were accepted. Edward Riney was appointed hydrant man for team number one and James H. Payne for team number two. P-A-Y-N-E, Payne. Gideon P. LeDuc was appointed hoseman on number one team, and William Gordon and William Tussignant appointed on number two team. Henry J. Healy was appointed hydrant man. That's the news in Westford for the week ending December 11th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to, Rick, to Ryan Cousins of Westford Cat for providing technic, technical support.
You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.